if you are a senior or executive job seeker and you didn't get the job offer, then let's find out why. Let's go straight to the C-suite hiring manager and ask them, what is it that they're really looking for when they're hiring a senior person just like you? Can't wait to find out what they've got to say. show. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. You're welcome, and, Andrew. Uh, so uh, why don't you give us a, a quick 5P introduction to yourself? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I help uh, CEOs at sub 100 million or startup um, financial institutions mitigate credit and operations risk. As an example of that, uh, reducing losses by greater than 450K last year. And I do that by leading effective operations teams. I would think so, being the COO. So today we're going to look at the hiring, the view from the hiring manager's chair. Yeah, uh, we're going to look at um, uh, the, the the view from the COO of sub 100 million financial services businesses serving the commercial market. Um, Andrew Howard is here, and he's going to give us a quick. Andrew, why don't you just give us a quick overview of the functions that report into the COO when you're normally in charge, so we understand the context of what we're talking about before we go sure. on. Sure. Uh, it my particular. Uh, influence, if you like, is in the financial services area, retail yep. or commercial financial services. And normally I'm looking after HR, IT, credit and operations. Fine. Okay. So credit. There are credit others that could be there, but these are the normal ones. Oh, and when you say credit, you, you mean credit risk, don't you? Credit risk. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. risk at risk and operations. Yeah. So ops, tech, people and credit risk. They're the big ones. And I, um, from that, there, there's obviously some big functions missing there. Um, marketing, sales, finance. Um, they will report outside of the COO line and into the CEO separately? Quite correct, yes. Cool. Okay. So when you're looking for a head of one of those kind of functions, what are the kinds of things you're looking for above the usual skills, knowledge, qualifications, and experience, which we presume they've all got? You know, um, sure. if they're, quite frankly, as a COO, you wouldn't be out interviewing somebody who didn't have the right skills, knowledge, qualifications, experience. So what is it else you're looking for, you know, when you go looking for a head of one of those functions? Sure. Uh, I'll start off a little bit with what I'm not looking for, and that's what's normally on the CV, which is their experience, etc. That's a given. Yeah. All right. So otherwise, they shouldn't be applying. What I'm looking for, um, in particular, normally the sub 100 million and the certainly the fintech startups are fast growing companies. So right. they start off small and they have this hockey stick growth. Yeah. So I need people who have the ability to grow along with the role mm -hmm. and have inquisitive minds. All right. Yeah. They don't necessarily have to know in everything, but they need to have inquisitive minds. And certainly in the risk area, I want them to keep asking questions until they have a full understanding of the problem that they're looking at or researching, whether it's internal or external. Got it. Okay, so a curious mind um, and the ability to look at the things internally and externally, uh, which makes sense to me. And... Um, if it's a given that, you know, they've got the right skills, they've got the right knowledge, the right qualifications, the right experience, because otherwise they wouldn't be interviewed by you if they didn't, um, then is there any sort of principal differences between HR, IT, ops and credit risk in terms of how you measure or, or, or what you look for in terms of their performance? Sure. Uh, if you take HR, for example, my way of looking at HR is they look after the well-being of the staff. Okay. Whether they're new staff, existing staff, all the things that go with that, getting paid on time, having your expenses paid, you've got the right chair, et cetera, et cetera. So empathy. I'm looking okay. for an empathetic person for that role. Where, where does that get you, though? If you look after your people well, what, what's the, so what, you know? I think that gets you a happier workforce. They're less likely to move if their needs are being met and happy. You okay. know, start startups and fintechs might work longer hours than they might be expecting. If there's something to do, it needs to get done. And an example I use, and it's not necessarily an HR example, but um, there was a deal that came across our desk to look at. Um, a, a large bank had had it for four and a half weeks. Myself and my staff worked over a weekend to get that deal done. So we took three days to do what the bank hadn't managed to do in four and a half weeks. That took time, took their weekends away from them. So what we're saying there, if the right HR, the head of HR, 
um, candidate that you would choose would be someone who's prepared to invest in the people um, and show them some love through empathy, um, which manifests itself in lots of ways, but you know, certainly being paid on time and getting their expenses sorted out, not dragging your heels, because ultimately that produces revenue when, particularly when the pressure's on. You can say, do you know what, we can ask something back from our people now, and that shows up on the bottom line. So for you, HR isn't a cost center so much as a, um, an occasional revenue enabler. Correct. Okay. Correct. That's quite interesting, isn't it? I don't know how many HR people see themselves as that. Mm. Um, let's talk about IT then. Um, what does IT do for you then? Not, not tactically, but in terms of what's the, what, how do you know whether or not you've got the right IT person in terms of their outputs? Sure. What I'm looking for with an IT person is they have a set of skills. They do Agile or Jira or, you know, all the, the buzzwords that IT people love to pop on their CVs. Yeah. You know, they've got a page and a half of all the stuff they, they know how to do. But when you're in a growing industry, you look, you, you grow quickly, but you also expose yourselves to risks. So reporting is very important. So I want someone who will develop, is prepared to develop their skills. I nearly said his skills, which is wrong. Yeah. Um, some of the some of the best are, are actually at this are tend to be females, but are prepared to put some effort in and develop their skills outside of what they already know. So, if you're, and I imagine this is true across all functions. Actually, if you're in a fast growth business and a propensity to invest in yourself might show that you have a growth mindset, which means you're going to be more aligned to the way the business operates. Exactly right. And I mean, coming back to the fintech again, which is where a lot of my experience is, they might start off doing a set of products and realize, hang on, there's a gap in the market. We need to swerve off and go in a different direction. That takes fast work from everyone, including IT, to develop a whole new product, you know, a platform or whatever the IT might be, and the reporting requirements behind that to cover off the risk side of things as well. So they need to be agile and fast thinking. Okay, so I'm hearing a common theme there, which you know perhaps isn't colossally surprising if you're a sub 100 million financial services business, which is a relatively small one, um, and you're perhaps dealing in the SME commercial market space, that um, growth is going to be the principal um, watchword for the business. And therefore, those functional heads uh, need to have a growth mindset, both personally and, and corporately. Correct. I mean, at the start off, it's all about revenue, isn't it? Um, you want revenue to come in the door, which is yeah. growth. You get that by growing your sales portfolio rapidly. Um, and then behind that, you need the risk team to protect that investment that you've put in uh, and the ops team to make sure it all works. I always talk about the ops team as being the engine room. OK, well, let's talk about ops then, because... Um, that's a, one of those catch-all titles that means a lot of different things, but operations in retail financial services has got a ton of processes inside it. Um, some of that's related to just processing you know, paperwork and admin and, and you know, checking boxes, but sometimes it's about other things. How do you know you've got a good ops person sat opposite you for a head of operations role? Sure. What I'm looking for is very similar to the others. I'm looking for, but here is where the inquisitive mind comes in. Yeah. I want somebody who will ask the client the right questions and drill down and really understand that client. So when they present the client to us for onboarding or for approval and all those sorts of things, they know that client inside out. They know that the client is going to be happy with what they're given. This is a little bit more than just, you know, regulatory checkbox ticking though, isn't it? it? Because, you know, I, I worked in that space um, for a fast growth retail bank. And I know that there's a certain tipping point when you come to the notice of um, the, the retail market. And those people who perhaps are bad actors in that marketplace will go, ooh, a new financial services business we can swindle a bit of cash out of. Um, how does that impact on what you're looking for in an operations chief? Yeah. Again, that you know, now we're now we're delving into the risk side of things, and again, I want them to drill down and understand the issues. Um, I have what I call regular portfolio meetings, for example, with mm -hmm. with operations and risk staff, and instead of me doing all the portfolio management, if you like, I have my staff, a different staff member, every week present to me, so that they all understand the whole portfolio and 
get involved with the whole, whole portfolio, not just their little square box that they're in and they're just ticking off theirs. They're happy. Now they can sit back, take no further part in the conversation because their bit's over. If they're presenting, they have to understand the whole portfolio and the risks inherent in the whole portfolio. So they get an overall umbrella view of how the company is doing okay. and what it needs to do to do it better. So picking on different people to present the full portfolio is breaking down that silo mentality um, and allows that inquiring mind, that inquisitiveness, perhaps a bit more free reign, an enabler, um, which is uh, inherently um, a risk protection function, isn't it? Because, you know, if, they, if, they, if they're being enabled to be curious and they're given remit to poke around in other areas so they get a, a perhaps a, a fuller picture, as you say, an umbrella picture, then you might uncover risks that wouldn't have got done if it was compartmentalized. That's quite correct. And it's often actually the newest member, the newest hire that alerts you to a potential risk because That's they're right. coming coming at it from an outsider's perspective effectively and yeah. saying, hang on a minute, that doesn't look right. Cool. Um, if you're um, uh, watching us live, uh, we're with Andrew Howard, COO of Sub 100 million retail financial services businesses, particularly those businesses that are serving the commercial market. And Andrew's talking us through the kind of things that he would look for when he was interviewing uh, heads of functions, particularly those functions that report into the COO, which are HR and IT and risk and operations, um, particularly credit risk because it's financial services. If you've got any questions and you're watching live and you want to um, put them in the um, chat box, uh, you know, what about this, what about that? We're sat right in front of the hiring manager right now. I'd be interested to hear um, what your questions are. Tell me a little bit about, um, culture, because COO is one of those people who's often lumbered with the responsibility of <laughs> um, creating or, or, or enabling a, a particular culture. What kind of cultural things are you looking for and how do you get them done? Because, you know, if you hire the wrong people, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. I, I think when you look at what I like to see, which is an inquiring mind um, and, and diving into the detail and those sorts of things, um, you've got to be very careful that you don't get people who are just box tickers, as you yeah. suggested, because that's the wrong approach. So I ask all my interviewees to make a short five to 10 minute, no longer than 10 minute presentation at during the hiring process. And I just want them to tell me a bit about themselves. And part of the route, not their experience necessarily, but about themselves. Um, and I want that because I want to see that A, they are prepared to present and they, they do have an inquiring mind, but also to get to the human side of, you know, the bits that's never on a CV or mm. never on most CVs. Um, good CVs will have some human aspect to them, but your average CV, frankly, that we tend to see these days from, particularly from recruiting agents, they've got them to strip all that information out. And that's the information I actually want. Because I'm, I'm taking their experience as a given. That's all, that's all been done and dusted before they get to me. So I want to know, who are you? What do you do? Are you going to fit within the organization? Um, and do you have what I'm looking for, this inquiring mind? You don't necessarily have to tick 100% of the boxes that I'm looking for as far as experience goes if you have that human element and that communication element. Well, that's an interesting thing you just said there, that you know, there's going to be some cultural tension if the heads of hot ops and HR and IT and credit risk are all allowed to know um, as much about each other's businesses as is required to be able to present uh, an umbrella view. Um, so you're going to get other department heads poking their nose in, which, you know, it might be uncomfortable if, if things aren't going brilliantly well, as was, will happen from time to time. Not everything runs smoothly. And then secondly, um, that, you know, if you've got that right kind of individual who's prepared to do that um, uh, and also have other people, you know, poke their nose into their own businesses, um, that actually for you that trumps, um, you know, experience and skills and qualifications and, and, and knowledge to a certain extent because you can teach that stuff, but the culture fit is harder to, to teach. Um, yes, yeah, so I, 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 
uh, sorry, I was just going to say, I'll, I'll add into that as well, that, that they don't always have the experience. You know, you've probably heard the classic um, wall that exists between credit risk and sales, for example, yeah. all right? Because sales want every deal written. They're always perfect. This client's the best thing they've ever seen this week. And credit say, well, actually, no, it's, 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 it's not. Um, you know, what are you, what are you even considering this for? Now, the only way, to, in my opinion, to break down that is to make everything transparent. And I'll trot out a cliche here and say the old open door policy that I'm sure everyone listening has heard. Every time they join a company, they say, we have an open door policy. Ask whatever question you want. Well, actually, that is what we do. That's what I'm looking for. I want the head of HR to say sometimes, you know, Actually, I've dealt with that person before and they weren't very nice to deal with and such and such. Mm. They won't understand the credit risk, but they've got a feeling as well. They've, they've spoken to them. They understand it. And then that focuses the credit team to look closer. Everybody has a view and yeah. they're all valid. There's no stupid question. And you and I were talking previously um, about... Uh, salespeople not necessarily understanding other people's jobs because they're very focused on the customer and they're sort of very outward facing, which is normal for salespeople. But actually, you think they'd get more deals um, uh, by having a more qualitative approach to their customer base if they understood a little bit more about risk. So they could spend less time chasing the wrong deals um, by sifting them out earlier because they understood risk better. Um, I know you're not hiring salespeople because that doesn't report into you, but it'll have an impact on the risk function if they're introducing better quality business. How do you get them to do that? Because, you know, if HR and ops and IT and, and risk are all on the same page culturally, then you better make sure that sales, marketing and finance yeah. are, otherwise you've yeah. got two warring factions inside your business and you're in charge of one of them. And and we do that by you do that by bringing them into the equation. So uh, what I would normally do is I would run training sessions for the sales sales staff on just the basics, how to read a balance sheet. I mean, about three roles ago, I was stunned when I was brought in to to parachute it in to try and save a company, and their sales staff, one of them, had been in the, in the role for fifteen years and had never read a balance sheet. So this guy had been guy in this particular case had been selling a financial product to clients without understanding finance himself that's not his fault all right he, but you resolve that by training how can you possibly sell a finance product and not know what an asset is and what a liability is uh, do you know what I, I i take a harder line on that and i was an executive director of a fast growth bank for three years and I think if you're in revenue generation and you don't understand the quality of one lead from another because you've never bothered to understand what goes on after the business is brought on, um, then you just don't care enough, uh, at which point I think that's entirely on you. Um, mm. It's not their he fault. La he, last, he lasted about six months longer, to be brutally honest. But yeah, you know, um, he was allowed to get away with it. Let me put it that way. Yeah, I, to that. You know, if, 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 if you don't want to learn about what goes on either side of your own job, um, yeah, you are. You're a box ticker, and, and you know those people. Yeah, yeah, right. That's my personal view. I'll sort of stop ranting. <laughs> so, so when you when you're in your next COO role and you're hiring for head of, um, you're looking for an inquiring mind. You're looking for personal development. Um, you're looking for um, the ability to be transparent, which means allowing other department heads to poke their nose into your world, and the ability to have a an umbrella view by poking your nose into theirs and to allow other areas that don't even report into you um, to have some visibility of what's going on. So you've got some transparency and some interconnectedness then, some, some corporate empathy, actually. People understand what's going on after they've done their bit. Um, more than you're interested in, you know, N number of years experience or why, you know, qualifications, et cetera. It's, it's, it's about that growth mindset. Correct. Because the growth mindset means they can learn all the rest of it. That's true. Right. That, that's, that's the easy bit. The harder bit is getting somebody who doesn't do these things and trying to teach them how to be out, not outgoing because I'm the world's worst introvert, but I have the ability to, to, to be outgoing when I need to be. All right. That comes through experience and putting yourself out there. I'd rather have that and teach somebody how to have a balance sheet than have it the other way around. Nice. Uh, everybody who's listening in to us live right now, that's Andrew Howard, COO of Sub 100 Million 
uh, financial services, particularly fast growth financial services businesses that serve the commercial marketplace. So we're talking medium, small to medium sized end of businesses there about what you look for when you're hiring heads of functions, particularly those that report into the COO, IT and HR and ops and credit risk and growth mindset and personal development and an inquiring mind and transparency. All of these things that are probably not very highlighted, if at all, on the job description are the things that are going to make a difference between whether you get hired or not with your CV. How do you, how do you, it is a question. How would someone demonstrate that on a CV before they've met you? How do you decide to get them in? You say, yeah, I read a CV and there was some stuff on it that was more than just the, the stuff that's on the job description. What does that look like? I think if, uh, for me, uh, two ways. One, uh, find me. Don't come through a recruiter necessarily. I know most people use recruiters, but actually I will have a look at anything that crosses my desk. I might not need you now, but uh, if something comes up in the future, I'm far more likely to come back to you, frankly, than go through a recruiter. But in the old days of a CV, it was called hobbies and interests down the bottom of, 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 of the CV. And people used to put, like mine used to say, genealogy, narrow boating, um, et cetera, et cetera. Put a sentence in on each of them. So personalize it, you know, genealogy. Um, two generations ago, two of my fir first cousins got married and I have no claim on Castle Howard. That's a much better read than just having the word genealogy there. Yeah, yeah, nice. Right? That, yourself. If that makes me want to ask him, two first cousins married, is that why you've only got, you know, one arm or it just, it, it, <laughs> it humanizes it. And that's what it's all about, you know, cool. on mine. Um, for, yeah. A comment here from Robert saying salespeople shouldn't be wasting their time on a sale that risk will reject. A good salesperson will happily talk to risk to understand their decisions. Um, and I, I think, think Robert that, nailed it. Yeah, yeah uh, Robert, I think you, you know, used the, the right word there, a good salesperson. Good salesperson, correct. Um, whereas perhaps the weaker ones are more interested in just you know the customer, the revenue, and the, the, the commission. Um, so Andrew, I wanna say thank you so much for coming in and sharing us um, half a dozen nuggets of absolute wisdom there. Not often people get to hear from the hiring manager. Feedback via the recruitment process nowadays is negligible. So really useful to hear. Virtually everything you said today is not on the job description. Isn't that interesting? Correct. Yeah, um, so it begs the question, how do people align themselves well um, with the hiring manager when the stuff that HR are asking for by the job description is a bit too tactical for the COO. Um, uh, maybe the COO should get out there front and center and say, this is what I'm really looking for and bring the job descriptions like, who knows? Uh, we've got another comment in here from Alina saying that if anybody wants to connect to Andrew, um, Andrew's uh, LinkedIn address is now on the screen um, because this is a, a, a live uh, broadcast. And... Uh, for me, it just re reminds uh, just for me to say thanks very much for coming in, Andrew. You've, you've I've dropped some real um, value in there. Uh, Stephen's saying, "Well done, Andrew." Um, so obviously, that's gone down well with at least one person that we know of. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing, uh, I've seen lots of happy faces in the um, comments box. So yeah, it's, it's, that's gone down well. Anything else you want to leave? Uh, parting, um, parting thoughts? No, uh, that's fine. Thank you very much, and thanks to everybody for listening to me. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and putting up with my New Zealand accent. Yeah. Uh, next week, uh, our next show, uh, we're in interviewing uh, CMO of digital media and entertainment industry. Uh, and I think I'm right. I should look this up. I might, may have got this slightly wrong, but I think this uh, former C uh, CMO who's previously worked at some pretty massive brands, places like Disney. Uh, so really interesting to find out what a heavyweight like that looks for when they're hiring uh, senior people in the marketing function. So stay tuned for that next week. In the meantime, I wanna say look after yourselves, take care, more help is coming.